Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Today our guest joining us on the program set up for a wonderful goal where he decided to visit Earth's 193 countries by the age of 35. Imagining that this journey's biggest revelation would probably let him know how many people like himself exist where each is pursuing a challenging quest. The more that he spoke with these strivers, the more he began to appreciate the direct link between questing and long-term happiness. Mostly going after something in a methodical way that may enrich a life. And he was also compelled to complete the comprehensive study of the phenomenon. And our guest will be talking about how to get there, the difficulties that may be faced along the way, and ultimately the joy that can be gained from the journey. Our guest is an entrepreneur, traveler, and a New York Times best-selling author. His first two books were The Art of Nonconformity and The $100 Startup. He recently completed his quest to visit every country in the world before, as I said, the age of 35. And he's also the host of the World Domination Summit. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest who's going to talk with us about the happiness of pursuit, Chris Gulliboo. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. 193 countries. That must have been something, huh? That's right. It was 192 when I got started, and then uh, somewhere along the way, a new country got added. South Sudan achieved its independence, and so I had to decide if I was going to add that one on or not, but I decided to go for it. You know, no excuses, no modifications. So it was about a ten and a half year journey, and I made it to all 193. Were you able to learn all the languages of each of the countries? <laughs> I know I was not. I didn't learn 193 <laughs> languages or, or even more than that. Now, tell us about what the happiness of pursuit is exactly. The happiness of pursuit is essentially about striving. It's about working towards something. It's about you know, setting a big goal, whether it's a quest or an adventure or just something that you believe in, and then kind of going all out for it. Uh, you know, when, when I had this idea, it was just a crazy idea. It was something that you know, I loved to travel, and I had I was always a list maker. I was writing down you know, my, to, my tasks and my to-dos and all those kind of things. And once I started traveling, I, write a, I wrote down the list of countries I had been to. And I kept wanting to do it more and more. And I finally had this idea, like, this is a totally ridiculous idea to go to every country in the world. But I can't stop thinking about this idea. And I, and I just know, like, I have to go for it. I have to at least attempt it or I'll always end up regretting it. And I found a lot of happiness. Uh, through that, I found a lot of purpose through kind of working towards this goal and, and achieving different milestones and stages and levels along the way. And then, as you alluded to in your kind introduction, uh, I met a lot of great people. I met a lot of people who were also pursuing a quest and adventure, like regardless of their situation, even if they couldn't go to every country in the world, uh, they had found happiness or purpose in pursuing a quest or an adventure and, and framing that as an important part of their lives. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you discuss uh, certain people in your book, and there are some amazing journeys that some of these ta uh, actually take. Uh, Scott Young was one that I was really interested in. Tell us about him. Yeah, Scott was a, a young Canadian guy who had graduated with a business degree, and maybe about you know, two or three years into that degree, he realized he actually wanted to study computer science instead. And usually it doesn't go that way. You know, Computer science is a much more difficult degree, so... People tend to start out with that, and if it's too difficult, they switch to something easier. So he just decided to go ahead and finish his, his business degree. But then after that, um, he had this crazy idea, just like I did. His crazy idea was to attempt the four-year computer science curriculum at MIT, so one of the most uh, challenging curriculums you know, anywhere. And he decided to attempt it on his own independently and doing it in just one year. And so he, he was able to download all the tests. MIT makes all their curriculum publicly available, so he was able to download the exams and go through the whole process. And he devoted a year uh, toward mastering this curriculum, and he posted all of his results online uh, so people could kind of critique it. And you know, some went better than others, but at the end of the year, he did, in fact, you know, accomplish that goal. He did, in fact, you know, complete the four-year curriculum in only one year. Now, tell us about what the challenge of that, that particular journey really is. I mean, you're talking an MIT computer science curriculum in one year versus four. That's, you know, daunting to think about it. But what was right. the reason behind well, that? Well, there's a lot of challenge to it. I mean, obviously, there's the daunting curriculum itself. You know, it's probably the greatest challenge. But then maybe the other challenge is working independently, uh, you know, not, you know, going through that process with other people, not going to the physical lectures, uh, but he kind of, you know, honed in on what was most important. Um, he, you know, he had spent a lot of time in his undergraduate career kind of learning to study better and, and learning to maximize his time for the, the highest, 
you know, possible efficiency. I mean, he's, he's much better at that than, than I would be or many other people. That was just kind of his thing. He was really into optimizing, and so he saw this as a goal. And, you know, once he had the goal, it was like, okay, that's, you know, that's a really big goal, and you know, I, I just have to go, go for it. I think after that, actually, he, he set another goal of, uh, of not speaking English for a year. So he had spoken maybe one or two other languages. He learned French in Canada, uh, but then he started moving around to different places, and he, he moved to China, he moved to Korea, uh, he moved to Spain, and, and his whole goal with learning these languages was to actually not speak English for an entire year. So he's a very quest-driven person. Now, it's interesting when you consider the mindset of these people that you actually talk about in your book. What was that for you? I think the mindset is one of... Uh, curiosity, you know, initially. It's one of just kind of what would it be like, you know, to do something like that. And, and then maybe a willingness to take action on some of those things because a lot of people have big dreams, but then what we tend to do is, is kind of just write those dreams off or we kind of downsize those dreams. And we say, oh, maybe I'll, you know, I'll do that later in life or maybe I, maybe I didn't really want that. I'll just do part of that uh, Maybe I didn't really want to travel the world. I just wanted to travel once. You know, and, that, and that's fine. Like, I think we all go through you know, seasons of change and things. But I, I guess what I saw in a lot of these people is that they, they did find a way to pursue that original dream. They did find a way to do whatever that thing was, um, again, regardless of their situation. And, and they came from all different backgrounds, all different ages, men and women. Uh, they weren't all pursuing travel quests. Uh, there were a lot of other different kinds of quests as well. But I guess the key thing is they found something that mattered to them, and then they oriented their life around that. Now, speaking of meaning, I found this one to be interesting, and that was a woman who went on a date in each of the 50 states. Boy, there's something. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That was uh, Alicia Ostarello, who's from San Francisco, and she had just gone through a, a difficult breakup, and she was processing that experience, and she kind of looked back on her other relationships and realized that there was a certain pattern to them that maybe wasn't healthy, or, or maybe she just kind of needed to to break the routine in some way. And so, you know, as you said, she, she went on this road trip, you know, to all 50 states and had a date in, in, in each one of those states. And she brought a friend of hers along for the journey, and they made a documentary out of it. Um, and it was really interesting. I don't know if she found true love, you know, through that process, um, but she certainly learned a lot about herself and, and had, a, had a crazy journey along the way. Probably inspired by the movie Fifty First Dates, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to ask her that. You know, now when you think about some of the goals that, or the journeys that the people that you feature in the book here, and you consider, for instance, every time New Year's Eve rolls around, we always set these particular goals, whether it's trying to earn more money, find a better career, you know, some way that we want to improve our lives. And then maybe a week goes by, or if we're lucky, a month, we're in the pursuit of that, and somehow it just falls off. What is the difference between someone like that and what we're talking about here, where these guys really hold on to it and make sure they put one foot in front of the other and at least move in the direction that they want to? Yeah, resolutions are interesting things. You know, I, I always say, like, that the busiest time of, of any gym or fitness center is always January 2nd. You know, you go January 2nd and the place is just packed out, you know. You go, like, 10 days later, it's, it's starting to kind of, you know, spin the ranks. So they always run all these big specials, you know, right around New Year's time. Um, I think there's a couple of things. I think, you know, sometimes we, we set kind of vague goals, and, and we, want to, we want to improve our lives, but we're not really specific about how we want to do it, you know, and it, it's kind of, kind of like we're admonishing ourselves, like, oh, we need, we need to lose more weight. Uh, we need to get fit. Um, you know, we need to eat healthier. We need to, you know, make more money or otherwise improve our finances, but it's not really specific, and, and we also don't necessarily have, you know, the motivation to do those things, even if we know that, it's something that we should do. It's not something they're really excited about doing. And I guess, um, you know, what, what I saw in all these people who pursued a quest, you know, it wasn't, all, it wasn't always exciting. Um, there was, an, you know, an element of the slog to it. There was a, a long middle portion in a lot of these quests. Um, but for whatever reason, they really believed in them. They really did say, okay, like, this matters to me. Like, I am really focused on the long term. I'm going to make short-term decisions. Uh, to support the long-term results uh, that I'm working toward. And, and people struggled along the way, and there were lots of misadventures, you know, and some people did give up, but most of them were able to see it through as long as they maintained that, that, that clear motivation. And they knew that they were doing it for themselves, not because they had to, not because they were supposed to, or because someone else expected it, but because they believed in it themselves. Now, how does someone, let's say a quester, as they could be called, decide on what to pursue and, you know, the things to avoid, for instance? I think uh, a lot of people find, you know, those things by a process of experimentation. 
by a process of you know pursuing different things that they like and asking themselves you know, like what are they excited about and if that if that seems a little generic then then let's make it more specific and maybe even go back to childhood and say okay what what were you excited about when you were 10 years old and what did you want to be when you grew up and, and what were those things that you enjoyed doing and maybe at a certain point in life you, you kind of started to have to go down this track and you, you kind of pursued these decisions that close doors to other things, and, and that's fine. That's a normal part of life, but maybe there's something that, that you missed early on um, that you can go back to. Another thing to think about is not just what excites you, but what bothers you, what troubles you about the world, um, you know, what, what annoys you. Of all the problems in the world, you know, what's the one that bothers you the most? Uh, a lot of the people you know, that I talked to, they found that quest um, by focusing on some specific improvement they wanted to make. Uh, or something they wanted to do for others. And maybe it was more for themselves, and that's okay too, but they, they focus on a lot of different things. And then at some point, um, they found, you know, the whole quest thing is about finding a packaging or a wrapper for your thing. So it's like you, you've got something you love to do, like I love to travel. But then when I combined travel with goal setting, with the list, with the 193 countries, it made so much more sense because then I knew specifically, okay, here's what I have to do. Here's what I have to work toward. And, I've got this list, and I'm making progress, and I'm you know, counting down 50 countries, 100 countries, all the way up. So I think having something specific um, that you can point to and say there's an end point to this goal, I think that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you're talking about people like this, and uh, a person like yourself goes on this quest, it's something that you know deep inside. It's the, something that you want to do. I, it's interesting to think about the people out there who decide they want to do these particular challenges just for the sake of saying they did them, whether it's doing K2 or mm -hmm. sailing around the world. And you, know, and, and you find people who ravenously try to pursue these things just for the sake of saying they did that. There is a difference between that and what we're talking about here, isn't there? Yeah, I think it's tricky. I think it's hard. I think you know, when, you, when you talk to people who pursue things like that, you know, myself included, at least for a long time, like we're not always good at, at, at articulating our motivations. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who wants to climb like this largest mountain, like they're not always able to describe like what it was that, that gave them that dream. They just know that it's something that, that matters to them or they want to be able to say that they've done it, as, as you said. And so it, it can be tricky because, you know, I don't think it's the, the healthiest thing to, you know, pursue this, you know, long-term goal because of, external recognition or because you want to be able to say that you did it or something. I think it's much more powerful when your motivation is internal. and It's, it's not about proving it to anyone else. It's about proving it to yourself. Um, it's not about, you know, a career move or a business goal or something. But I also think, you know, like our lives are complicated and our lives are intertwined with different things. And if someone isn't always able to say exactly like why they want to do something, it doesn't mean it's invalid or that their, their motivations are, are somehow impure. So I think it's complicated. Yeah, I can see how it could be, but then you also wonder, too, when someone goes out in a way of trying to, let's say, conquer and put it into their belt or, you know, the sure. notch in the bedpost, for sure. instance, that at the end of the day they feel, well, I've done that, but I don't feel any more, I guess, fulfilled than I did in the beginning when I thought if I could just do these things and tell people about them, you know, that right. I was going to be, you, you see what I'm getting at there? Yeah, no, I totally do. I, I, think, I think it's important to... Uh, you know, to understand, again, understand, like, why, why we're, we're doing them. And there has to be some value that goes beyond the, the notch in the belt. There has to be some value that occurs, you know, along the way. And I, I think for most people it does. Like, I feel like it's, it's impossible to do something like, you know, go on a 50-state road trip or, um, you know, visit every country in the world. I think it's, it's impossible to do that without being changed along the way somehow, at least, at least hopefully. So, so, yeah, if you did all of that and if you climbed K2 and there was no change or transformation, that would be very sad, but you know, I, I think it would be difficult to, to go through everything you have to do to to train for and to you know travel and to undertake those challenges, and you know, then just just for the point of saying that you've done it. I was thinking, you know, as we're talking about this, uh, back in the 1960s when there was the big pilgrimage to Hate Ashbury, San Francisco, mm, right. <laughs> and it's fascinating the people who actually did it and what was happening in that area in a very natural way. It was almost as though, or it was, should we say, happening without the participants in the beginning being aware that it was happening until after it was over with. And I know that you talk about that it's pretty important to document a quest, but you think about, for instance, you know, even the movie Forrest Gump comes to mind when he starts going on his long run, and then all of a sudden he's got this band of followers that think there's something that... 
he knows that they need to find out about. Then all of a sudden he's done running and they stand there and they're thinking, well, now what are we supposed to do? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot you can say about that. You know, I, for me, I, I derived so much joy just in the, in the process of, of the milestones and the stages and seeing, like, the progress I was making. And sometimes it was two steps forward and one step back. Um, but fortunately, like, I, I enjoyed both the process and the destination. And, and by the time I reached that destination, like there, there was a, a bittersweet moment, you know, of coming to my final country because, you know, it had been a big part of my identity for for ten years. Like I was the guy who was going to every country in the world, and you know, that's that's what I did. And you know, I was going to keep traveling after that, of course, but you know, I no longer had that structure. But you know, at the same time, like you know, look at what look at what I had been able to to do, and look at all these great people I had met and this community that kind of was forged throughout the process. Um, so I, I, again, I think it's you know, it's a tricky thing, but these are good problems to have, right? This is like this problem of being like bittersweet or maybe re- reflective over the accomplishment of a big goal. You know, it, it's kind of like the problem of having like too much money and like, oh, I have to pay my taxes or something. Like, you know, it's a good thing. Now, tell us how important is it to document a quest? Oh yeah, you mentioned that. Um, I think I think it's good. I think uh, I think it's important, and people should choose like their own means of documenting. Uh, I started a blog about halfway through and began sharing that blog with readers and anybody else who, who cared about it. Um, other people are, are better photographers than me or videographers um, or found some other creative means of, of documentation. But I think it's good to be able to, to look back and say, okay, look, here's where I started and here's what happened along the way. And there was maybe a moment of challenge and here's a moment of triumph. Um, I think it's good to have some kind of archival record because that kind of, that kind of supports the whole quest aspect of it. Uh, it may, may also help you if you end up struggling at some point uh, or wondering, you know, is my heart still in this? Like, am I still motivated to continue? You can go back and look and see how far you've come. On our program, we've featured people who have done very dynamic quests, such as what you feature in your book. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is a couple who, at the age of 66 and 64, I believe it was, decided they wanted to walk the entire Gobi Desert. <laughs> wow. You know, I mean, now you consider something like that is just phenomenal. Much as what you did with 193 countries in 10 to 11 years, you know, and when you document those quests, and of course they did put this into a book, and there were some other things they did as well that were pretty phenomenal, like living among wolves for a couple of years. You know, amazing. Just, just amazing to fit, yeah. think, you know, here's past the age of 50, and it wasn't being wacko. It was just like what you're talking about, these people. Wow have something in them that compels them to do this. And they they call it sort of that voice or that calling that's beyond themselves that mm. compels them to go do this, much as like what you're talking about here. But you can imagine <clears throat> when they went to get started on this, <clears throat> the role that family and friends play. And a lot of times right. when you know you decide to do what seems to be one of these crazy things, sometimes that could be a barrier that's really overwhelming at times to overcome. Mm. You know, yeah, it, it, that's also a tricky thing. Uh, I mean, all the different people that I talked to, I heard from a range of experiences. I mean, some people, some people's family and friends were incredibly supportive, and yeah, other people, it was as you said, it was it was kind of the opposite, and, and people didn't understand. You know, whether it was parents or children uh, or you know siblings or just close friends of the network, like wh- why would you do this? And you know, you know, the word calling is a good one. Because a lot of people who do something like that, I mean, the Gobi Desert, that's, that's phenomenal. You know, like, you don't do that just, just for fun. You know, you do that because you have this strange sense of it's, mission, it's a missional thing almost, you know. And a lot of people that I talked with, uh, even people who weren't religious, like, they, they did use that word calling. They did, did feel like they had this, like, deeper sense somehow that was compelling them you know, to pursue this. And, and you know, as for friends and family, I, I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's always exceptions, but I think most of the time, you know, people, people tend to get used to things as time goes by. And I think people feel a little bit threatened sometimes in the beginning of something like this, especially if you haven't done anything like it before, and, like, now all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're going off to Gobi or wherever it is that you're going off to, or you've got this whole new focus in your life, and you've had these patterns before, and now you're kind of rewriting them. So those around us may, may feel a little bit threatened because maybe they see that, like, the stability of their world is changing in some ways, and... And so I think over time, like, if you, you know, pursue these things, but you still come home or you're still present or whatever it is that you need to do, like, then, then you know, it may end up being a good thing. 
you know, for your friends and family to see what you've taken on. And I also think it's important, uh, you know, you, you never want to turn your back on your friends and family, but if your friends and family don't believe in what you're doing, then I think you also need other friends as well. I think you do need to find people who, who get it, who relate to what you're doing, even if it's not the same specific thing, if they relate to the general concept of, of changing your life and kind of turning around in a different direction and doing something. I think it's, it's really good to have some support network. I also think, too, many times that when it comes to friends and family and you decide that there's this particular quest, such as the one that you have or the ones we were sharing earlier, where, you know, they mean well when they're mm -hmm. doling out their advice, but the fact is, is they're projecting their own fears, perhaps, mm -hmm. yep. that you may achieve this and they mm -hmm. have to stand by and watch. <laughs> right. Yep, that's a great way to put it. They don't, they don't always like to hear that, by the way, but I think it is a great way to put it. Now, tell us what happens to someone after they've achieved this quest or goal, so to speak. I think what happens is a, is a necessary pause or moment of reckoning or reflection or introspection. Um, you know, it can be kind of a cathartic process to go back and maybe look at some of that documentation and say, okay, like here's here's what happened all along the way. You know, in my case, um, you know, I went to the final country last year. By the time I actually made it to the final country. Like it was great. It was a wonderful experience. I had a, I had a community of friends, and a lot of my readers actually came to join me. So we had more than 200 people, you know, going with me on that final trip. So I wasn't really alone a lot during that trip. But then afterwards, it was kind of like, okay, you know, now that's now that's done. And I did kind of go through a little bit of sadness and maybe a mild depression. And fortunately, I I, I had to write a book about it. So it was a wonderful, you know, a wonderful excuse to to spend a lot of time thinking back about all those stories, you know, that I had kind of maybe forgotten about or glossed over before and kind of went back through. And, and then I think, uh, you know, so you have to do that one way or another, whether you're writing a book or not. I think it's helpful to kind of reflect on where you've come. And then you look to the future because um, this quest has made you who you are, but it doesn't, you know, you're not defined entirely by your past. And your past shapes who you are, but then you have a future. So what's next? You know, you have to think about, okay, I just had this great experience. Uh, what am I going to do with it? So I think that's helpful to look to the future as well. Now, there was a, a guest that we had on the program some time ago, and it was really fascinating what he put together. But his quest was to, and he wrote about his first 100 marathons. Mm, amazing. Now, you know, you consider something like that, and as I was reading through his book, it was really amazing what started coming out for me. You know, and this mm. is the wake of the quest. You know, this is what yeah. this person leaves behind as they do this journey. You know, here's a guy that goes to Antarctica to run a particular mm. marathon they have down there for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> and, of yeah. course, there was a, a situation where it was so bad that they actually had to run the marathon on the ship. <laughs> mm. <laughs> if you can imagine wow. what that would be like. Yeah. But as I was seeing, you know, as I was reading and, 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 you know, listening to him as we talked about his quest, for instance, I realized what an interesting way to travel the world. <laughs> you know, because that's exactly what he was doing. He was traveling around right. the world and running marathons. So he had a common reason for going on this. And in the end, the kind of relationships that you build around the world, which I'm sure you, as you were mentioning mm -hmm. earlier, you did, it must give you an interesting perspective on your life and the lives of others, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so, especially maybe for, for those of us who are a little introverted or a little bit shy. You know, for having a reason to do something is, is great, even if it's not a reason that necessarily makes sense to other people because not everybody else is going to understand, like, why this guy wants to run a marathon in, on Antarctica. But if he does that, he's probably not the only one doing it, and there's probably you know crew of that ship involved, and maybe some other tourists on the ship. And it's just uh, it, it's a wonderful thing to say like you know I'm I'm doing this for this this particular reason, or it's it's providing kind of a a foundation to my wanderings. You know, it's providing like like I want to go and see the world, but you know the world is a big place. How do I choose where to go? How do I decide what to do when I get there? Do I go on a tour? Do I do it myself? But even then, there's, there's kind of some angst in, in all those decisions you have to make. Mm -hmm. But if you have this clear goal, I'm going to run 100 marathons or whatever it is, and, and most of us are probably not going to choose something like that. Um, but even if it's something you know, maybe less ambitious, it, it's very helpful to tie it to something, I think. It's, it was helpful for me anyway. Well, now, here's another fun one that you talk about here, and I consider this to be you know, one of those interesting goals, but... Sasha Martin, who cooked a meal in every country in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so he's spending someone... some time somewhere. Was he actually cooking their specific kind of dishes or just, just any meal? Yeah, well, this is a great story. because um, So she's, actually, she's not cooking a meal in every country. 
she's cooking a meal from every from country. From every country, okay. Yeah, so no, the distinction is important because, you know, she was a young mother from Oklahoma, and she had actually grown up in Europe in some different places, uh, but then kind of settled down, and she married and had a young daughter. And so she, her goal was, you know, I, wanted, I want to show my daughter the world. You know, I, I want her to see more, more than just what she kind of sees, you know, in her little neighborhood here. Um, but I can't travel right now. Like, I'm not able to go to every country in the world. So Sasha had a culinary arts degree. And so her quest, as you said, was, you know, she's going to cook a meal from every country in the world. And I love this because, you know, she made it really specific. You know, there, it was just like my quest. There's no modifications. There's no exceptions. You know, she had to study up quite a bit. Um, you know, she would spend part of the week researching the, the recipes and, and getting a lot of photos and playing music from that country and putting that country's flag up, and they, they would have a conversation, you know, about it around the table. So it's not just about food. It's also about people and culture and community. And this is all happening, you know, from her table, you know, mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. And her daughter, Ava, her first, her first solid food at the age of six months was Afghan chicken, starting with <laughs> Afghanistan, the letter A. You know, and then continuing like throughout the alphabet through every country, you know, um, you know, for two and a half, three years or so. So three years in, you know, Ava is three years old and, and now has favorite foods from all over the world and she eats with chopsticks or with silverware or with her fingers, you know. It's just it's just a great and Sasha talks about how what what a great transformative experience it was for her family because her husband was a was a, you know, self described picky eater, you know, when they started. Um, he had never eaten avocado, he had never seen an eggplant, you know, all these all these things that but he, you know, broadened his palate considerably through that um, mm -hmm. whole process as well. So that was something she did, you know, from where she was. She looked at what, you know, what her skills were and what she wanted to do. So she had this background in culinary arts. Um, she had a desire to see the world. She wasn't able to physically travel, but she kind of brought the world to her door. So I love, uh, I love that story because it shows that anyone can cultivate the value of adventure, uh, even if they can't get on an airplane. And it's also taking homeschooling to a whole new level, isn't it? Oh, definitely, yeah, exactly, yeah. What three-year-old has that kind of experience? <laughs> exactly. You know, and when you consider what she did and the fact that she's imparted or imprinted this particular motivation onto her daughter, it allows children to look at their, you know, their family, their, their fathers, their mothers, whatever, who say, you know, think big and do big things, and here she's mm. doing it, but you can actually do it from right where you're at to get started exactly. right where you're at. And I think a lot of people don't, pursue a quest or a goal sometimes because they somehow have this belief that's out of their reach. But many of these people just simply said, it's something I want to do. Let's mm -hmm. just put one foot in front of the other one step at a time and just see where it takes us. Absolutely. And you don't always even know where the, where the final destination is when you begin. Like you don't always necessarily have the whole vision. You maybe just have part of the vision, and then the vision expands through experience. And, and through experience, you gain confidence uh, as you as you work towards something that you believe in. You know, like for me, like I said, I didn't, I didn't want to go to every country in the world after I had just been to two of them. You know, I, I was an aid worker for four years in West Africa. That was a great experience. And out of that, I was writing, writing down the different countries I'd been to, and then I had the goal of going to 100 countries. And I kept working toward that one, and finally I realized, well, that's, that's a great goal, but I'm actually going to be able to achieve that a lot sooner than I thought because with 100 countries, it's only about half the world's countries. You can just kind of pick and choose the easy ones. You know, if I run into a difficulty somewhere, I can just go somewhere else. So that was fine, but then I wanted a greater challenge, right? So mm -hmm. as you kind of step out, like you made it discover that, you know, your initial vision was, was quite limited, and the, the vision is going to expand as you say yes to whatever you're able to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you discovered, as many of the people you feature in your book in The Happiness of Pursuit is this, is that you realize your goal, and any goal generally, is not linear like a lot of times mm -hmm. these self-help gurus would have us believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Your your goal may be multifaceted. Your goal may change. Also, I think that's totally okay. You know, I just I just finished this uh, forty city book tour across North America to talk with readers about this new book and had some really really great questions. And you know, maybe one thing I wish I had written about a little bit more in the book was what if your goal changes? Because a lot of that question came up over and over. And you know, my answer is if your goal changes, that's great. It's your goal. You know, <laughs> you're the one who set this. You know, so you have to ask yourself like. You know, it, is it okay for me to change my goal? And if, if, it, if you now have a different vision or a different uh, thing you want to do, then that's, that's great. It's, it's your, this is all about your life, you know? I remember, uh, it's so interesting that you say that because I think of Ed Shorts, who is the New York Times uh, crossword editor. 
Mm-hmm, right. And so I had a crossword book, and in the beginning of the book it talks about, you know, he's kind of sharing ideas and ways that you go about, you know, understanding and doing crosswords. And he mm-hmm. says one question that he gets asked all the time is, is it cheating if you look up, you know, let's say an answer in a dictionary, or if you go to the back, you know, and you decide that you mm-hmm. want to look up an answer? And he says, the simple answer to that question is, it's your crossword puzzle. You know right. that you've done that, but it's still yours. And I found myself from time to time having to do that just so I can jumpstart an area that I'm snagged in, yep. for instance, but moving forward. And still I feel pretty good about finishing it, even though that I knew I had to kind of sidestep it away. But, you know, as you're saying there, that's really okay. Don't beat yourself yeah, I mean, up over it. Exactly. Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is to become stalled. You know, the <laughs> right. alternative is to become totally stuck, and, and then, you know, then you just don't make any progress at all. So, so why not? You know, it kind of goes into the same the same category of the advice about giving up, you know, like I, I feel like, you know, we give, we give advice, you know, in, in our society, in particular to, to young people, but really people, like young people of all ages, we should say, you know, about how like, if you're, you're doing something, you know, that matters, like you should just never give up. And I think that's terrible advice because most of us, like, especially as we get older, like we, we can think of all kinds of things that we've given up on in life. And there's been lots of times that maybe something hasn't gone well. And the way that we find our way to something better is by, by giving up and moving on. That, that's, that's also okay. Mm. It's the, the idea to be flexible with your gold, certainly. Mm, definitely. Now, Chris, is there a website people can find out about the book and some of the stories and how they can go about maybe getting it? Yeah, sure. They can go to findthequest.com, or they can ask for the happiness of pursuit at any bookstore. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us on the program. We love doing these kinds of segments that step out of the normal self-help boundaries to allow people to see that there are extraordinary things happening from normal people, and all of us have that possibility to be able to pursue that happiness. Thank you so much for being on the program today. Oh, please. Thank you so much. Very good questions. I love the conversation. All right. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, so get out there and pursue your happiness and find out where that takes you. Remember, the journey truly is the reward. One journey you can take is visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50, and sign up for our free exclusive e-news updates. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway.